Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, this is Maddie Martin from Smith AI, and I have Nalini Prasad with me from Blue Shark Digital. And we are going to be discussing how to generate and capture web leads for your law practice, uh, focused on affordable strategies for solo and small firm attorneys. Now, just one housekeeping item before we begin. The link to the presentation slides that we will be sharing with you is on this first slide here. It is bit.ly, that's B-I-T dot L-Y slash convert law firm web leads with dashes between them. And that link will give you access to all of the slides, which you can review at your leisure. Um, and let's just uh, begin. Nalini is going to explain the big picture um, that we'll be talking about today. But first, I wanted to introduce myself. Then she will introduce herself and the topics we'll be discussing today. Um, Again, I'm Maddie Martin with Smith AI. We are a virtual receptionist and intake service for phone calls and web chat for solo and small firm attorneys in particular. And we have been around since 2015. I personally have been with the company for two years. I've got about a decade of digital marketing experience and focused very heavily on my role here as head of growth and education, where I'm helping uh, attorneys and solo and small practices improve their communications with leads and clients, um, provide that high level of responsiveness, and also balance work that can be outsourced, streamlined, and automated with the use of software and services. Um, Nalini, uh, do you want to introduce yourself and then also the big picture? So my name is Nalini and I'm with Blue Shark Digital. What we're gonna talk about today is essentially how to grow your firm online. Um, for the first half of the, the presentation, we're gonna talk a little bit about digital marketing and how you can grow your presence online, how you can leverage the things that you're already doing offline, online to an audience that's looking for an attorney in your practice area, but doesn't know your brand yet. Um, and once we go through the fundamentals of how we do that, we're going to turn to Maddie to deal with all of those leads that you're getting in. How do you then look at your intake and how do you streamline your intake to find those qualified leads? Um, I have been with Blue Shark Digital for um, since the beginning of our company. We are legal specific and we've actually spun out of a law firm. So Seth Price is Price Benowitz Law Firm. Um, he's the managing partner there and you know, he scaled his firm from two lawyers to 38 lawyers and found that that was heavily influenced by his digital marketing techniques. He then took his in-house marketing team and he turned us into a full service agency, Blue Shark Digital. Um, since then, we've been able to take the same techniques that we use with Price Brennanwitz and uh, apply those to firms all across the country. Personally, I have worked in a number of different departments in Blue Shark, kind of helping us create new strategies, thinking outside the box. How can we try this new thing that maybe Google hasn't, hasn't even discovered yet um, to stay ahead of the curve, essentially? So today I'm gonna tell you a little bit about those uh, fundamentals and the information that we've learned along the way in thinking outside the box. Um, we're going to begin with one of the latest Google algorithm updates. Uh, Google will come up with a new update once or twice a year um, it's generally just coming out with ideas that this is what's new with the ranking, this is what's going to help you, this is what's going to hurt you. What we saw in August was one of the largest Google updates that we've seen in about five years. Um, so what was the update about? Um, essentially, Google has placed a heavier value on making sure that the people who are providing the content on their websites are authoritative, are experts, and have the ability and the credentials to actually speak to what they are providing. Um, an example here of what we saw was everyone has kind of heard of the keto diet. Um, and essentially, this keto diet was being written about by mom blogs. Uh, so if you Googled it, the, the number one ranking website was either a blog or um, Fit Sally, someone telling you, here's what I did, here's how I lost all this weight. Uh, what we saw in this Google algorithm update is that Fit Sally is now at the bottom of page three, while the website that has replaced Fit Sally is a website with MDs, so actual medical doctors who are talking about the nutrition value and the real physics behind the keto diet. 
Um, what Google is basically saying here is, we want to make sure that when someone searches and we provide an answer for them, we're providing a safe answer. We don't want to be held liable if someone reads something that we've provided as an answer and then they do something crazy. Um, in that same respect, right, the business industry, the legal industry, we're giving information on what to do when you're in trouble, what to do when you've had a DUI, what to do when, you know, you're you're trying to get custody of your child. All of this information is very important that it is authoritative. Um, so one of the first things that we're gonna talk about here is our content, one of the four fundamentals. The four fundamentals that we're gonna take you through are content strategy, uh, technical SEO, which is all of that great coding stuff, what happens behind the scenes, link building, which is essentially how can you connect your website to other sites on the internet? How can other sites endorse you and show Google that you're trusted not only by the folks who will hire you, but also other people on the internet who run their own sites? And finally, we will talk about local search, which is how to optimize and get yourself placed as one of Google's top three uh, lawyers in a particular geography. One of the first questions that we always get with, with content, and many people have heard, you need good content, you need good content, you need to put a lot of content on your site. Um, but is it quality or is it quantity? And we answer both. Google wants to see that you are constantly providing high quality, sophisticated content, right? So by constantly, you don't wanna just be putting up fresh content that's meaningless. It has to mean something, it has to be authoritative, it has to provide value. That is really the key here. Um, a couple quick tips in terms of your content is that you wanna have about 500 to 700 words per page for your internal pages, and then for your what we call money pages or your main practice area pages and your home pages, your landing pages, you wanna make sure that those are at about a thousand plus words. In terms of how can you create strategic content, content that is seen as authoritative to Google, um, FAQ style content. So making sure that you're answering questions that people might be looking for, not just when they need a lawyer, but in general, maybe somebody wants to know what the most dangerous intersections are in uh, their town, or maybe they're looking up information on what happens during a field sobriety test. Just providing information that is good for any searcher is going to have you be looked at positively by Google. Uh, making sure that you're including your keywords, but not being spammy. There's a number of keywords that you want to have a ratio on each page, but you don't want every single paragraph to start with, you know, personal injury lawyer in New York. Um, you want to make sure that while you are putting these keywords in your content, that it is also very natural. So in that sense, you don't have to have the keywords be all together. When you're doing a long tail search, it can be that a lawyer in New York City that practices personal injury will blah, blah, blah. And what you have there is you have all of the keywords in your sentence, but they're not next to each other. It's still being read as, as an actual uh, keyword to rank you. I have a question here that I'm gonna answer. And also just wanted to mention that I like to keep this casual. As you have questions, please pop them up and I'll be paying attention to the, the question answer section um, throughout. Uh, 500 to 700 words per page. Is that equivalent to a type written page or a web page? That is going to be equivalent to it's a, an actual word count. If you opened up a Word doc and you checked by how many words were on that page, it's that. So that would be to me is exactly a typewritten page and a web page. The count should be the same. Hope that answers your question there. Um, leveraging your experts. So every one of you owns your own firm or is looking to own your own firm. You've been an attorney for a number of years. You want to make sure that the content that's going on your website is coming from you. It doesn't necessarily mean that you need to be writing all of that content, but you need to be providing what is legally sound and what can be there. Um, it will help with your credibility. 
Now, in terms of your content, one of the things that you wanna to do to differentiate yourself is also to go local in your content. Make sure that you're not just optimizing your content for keywords. So not just car accident lawyer, divorce lawyer, immigration lawyer, but also where are you located? Where are you targeting your audience, right? So you want to be um, a Raleigh personal injury lawyer, a Raleigh car accident lawyer. You can use your content to do this. Like, so by optimizing for content, I hear this a lot. It's, it's you don't wanna just have one page on car accident. You wanna have a car accident page for every location that you're looking to, to gain leads from, every location that you have a brick and mortar, but you cannot just copy and paste your content from one location page to the next. So how can you differentiate that text, right? Every law is the same, you're in the same state, um, what can I do? Well, every single city has different courts, right? So maybe you talk about the judges or the courthouses, or you reconfigure the content so that it is actually um, speaking to an audience of a different background, right? Every city also has its own culture. So sneaking in things about um, maybe the, the different intersections that are in city A over city B. Just kind of thinking outside the box as to how you can differentiate these different pages. When you produce rich content, very authoritative content, Google will reward you. And an example of how you're being rewarded kind of ties into technical here a bit, but I'm, I'm gonna try to explain the, the picture that we're looking at right now. Um, on the left, that is a print screen of our website. On the right, when you were to Google something, so if you Googled best pizza around me, um, you would see a list of paid ads at the top. You would see three local map pack results, which Google says are the best three pizza places in the area. And then you have 10 items underneath, which are your classic top 10 organic rankings. Um, when you look at each individual organic ranking, you'll see that there's the link that you can click on. And in our slide here, it's Virginia Reckless Driving Attorney, um, Pipe Thomas Solden. That is a title tag. On the back end of your website, you're able to type in what each page should be titled when someone is searching so that they can see that. Underneath that, you'll see a description. Um, this description is called your meta description and it is character limited. So you're able to put a sentence or two that tells the reader what that page is about. And it will always, it will always appear on your Google search. And when you have great content, and someone searches for something very specific that content on your web page answers, Google will actually replace your standard meta description with the words from your web page. So what you see here is highlighted is actually now showing in the search results to your reader. There's more of a chance that your reader is going to want to convert and go to that page because it answers their question exactly. Um, what you see below is what an a normal search result page looks like. That's your title tag, the website you're going to, and the short description. Just because you have all of your information and your coding done correctly and your content is great on your page, doesn't mean this will automatically happen for you, but it does heighten your chances. I hope that makes sense to everybody. Um, I know that it's we're gonna get a little technical in a bit too. Um, another way to to make your content go that extra mile is to use images. You're able to actually post images that are relevant to your content. It not only is good for user experience, but you're able to also mark up those photos and explain even more what this page is about. It's one more signal to Google that here is an additional item on this page that's saying that it is also about the same topic, the same subject matter. Um, so when using images, you wanna be careful uh, and you wanna make sure one of the biggest things is your usage rights, that you're not just taking a photo from Google um, that might be owned by somebody. One of the things that we've seen a lot in the legal industry specifically and something to watch out for um, is we're getting lots of letters. I've heard from firms that they get letters in the mail that say, you know, this is copyrighted image, um, you can't use it, and it's actually a scam. So just be very careful when you get those types of um, letters in the mail and also be very careful when you choose images to use. Now, tips on how to become a thought leader. Um, 
to go above and beyond, to actually be someone that people are going to go back to your site and want to read about. You want to establish a brand. You want a niche. So if you are specific to longshoreman cases or you're specific to very, maybe you're a divorce attorney, but you are focusing on dad's rights, take that to the next level. Use that specific information that you have and expertise that you have um, to create a blog. But if you're gonna do it, you have to do it correctly. You want to make sure that you're always, always, always going to commit. So if you, bego if you begin a blog, you're gonna want to make sure that you're doing that regularly um, or you're letting down your audience, right? You wanna become trusted. Um, set yourself apart. So make sure that when you're writing about something, you're writing, writing about a genuine interest. Um, in terms of, of writing about your genuine interest, the passion will come out and it will result in, in much greater content, much richer content, and, and your followers will see that in your writing. Um, something else that we've seen a lot of lately are the FAQ videos. Um, people will post just a, a question that you get and you can make a series of 10 videos. Maybe you do one a month or you do one every two weeks, something regular that folks are looking out for. Um, it will help keep people on your page and it'll help with conversions as well. Um, and then another great thing that you can do is once you establish yourself as an expert is kind of reaching out to legal blogs or regular political blogs, whatever, whatever local blogs are around you um, and becoming an expert that people want to quote. So if somebody will quote you in one of their articles on their blogs, you can have your name linked back to your site. Um, that backlink is very valuable and something that we're going to discuss in its own section. Now, in terms of the Google algorithm update that we talked about in August, for content, what that means is that you want to make sure that your credentials are very clear on your website. You want to make sure that your About Us page has where you graduated from, any of your super lawyer awards, any of your local awards, whatever it may be. Make sure that you're selling less, um, less keyword spamming, and more information information that people can actually use whether or not they're looking for a lawyer. Um, and be sure to, to keep your word count at a, an optimal level. You don't wanna be stuffing pages and just posting information just to post information. It needs to be meaningful. Um, technical, I'm gonna kind of go through a little quicker. I'm happy to answer questions after, happy to provide our slides. Um, at the end, but technical is going to essentially be all of the stuff that happens behind the scenes. Your development guys are mostly in this. Um, so optimizing for mobile is the biggest, the biggest thing that you can do for every action in the back end when you're you're on your WordPress site or whatever you may be using as your platform. There is an equal action that you need to take in order to have your mobile site optimized. Um, more than 50% of searches are being done on mobile now. And I'm sure you guys, even when you're checking your, you know, checking your website, you're looking at it on mobile. So very important that that speed and that that functionality is there because if people are searching something on their site, they click on you, you could be ranked number one, but if you get to your site um, and you see that it's a mess, no one's gonna stay on that for more than five seconds, right? Um, your title tags we, dis we discussed earlier and your meta descriptions, those are very important because it's what the user sees um, when they're searching and it's what's gonna compel them to click through. Uh, page speed is becoming more and more of a ranking factor. Um, and then schema, which is structured data. This is basically the ABCs and the dictionary that Google has put out for its coding. It tells you exactly how to code every aspect of a website. You wanna make sure that that is correct because more and more on the front end when you're searching for something, we're seeing Google automatically pull information from your website. We're seeing them show certain items that you don't even know might be on your website. Um, for page speed, and I do have a question here before I go on, Jillian asked, are there places to gain free images or should we have subscription to Shutterstock? Um, so Shutterstock's always the best, right? If you're doing things for free, most times they're not gonna be um, <laughs> exactly perfect, but Shutterstock is always a great way to go. I do have a few resources that we use um, that are free, they have the correct copyright, um, legal uh, information at the bottom of the page. One of them is Pixabay, P-I-X-A-B-A-Y. I have a couple more that I'll uh, throw in there while Maddie's presenting. I'll put it in the, 
um, in the chat or I'll, I'll get back to you at the end of the presentation. But there definitely are some free ones. Just making sure that the licensing information is correct is going to go a long way for you. And jumping back to page speed, um, this website, very important. It's Google's site that will actually test your page speed, tell you where you are. A good score is 80 to 100. If you're at 80, it's, you know, it's just as good as being at 100. You just want to be somewhere in there and your load speed, you want it to be two to four seconds. Um, more than that, our attention span these days, right? We'll go to another site. Um, in terms of when we were talking about the structured data and schema, um, the pictures that you see here to the right are going to show you examples of how coding based on the language that Google asks you to code with shows up differently in the front end. So at the very top, you see a regular search result, but below the rich snippets, you can see that um, there are stars there now. And how many, I'm, you know, usually I'm in a room and I can say, how many of you have seen the stars? And I see some hands go up, but, um, but if you see five stars, right, and you see four more listings of law firms and none of them have stars, you're naturally inclined to click on the, the result that has the stars. You're like, oh, wow, that's a five-star rating. Um, in addition to that, if you look below the meta description, below the little description, you'll see that there is burn injury, DC pedestrian accident lawyer, um, DC medical malpractice lawyer. Those are links. And what that comes from is your menu. So what Google is seeing is because it's marked up correctly on the back end, the bot is able to read what all of this information is, and it's able to pull more information to be in front of the searcher that might help them click onto your site. Um, maybe this person had looked specifically for you know, pedestrian accidents, and so what they did was they made sure that you could have a quick link there and you could learn more about the site. Um, Below the second one, you'll see that that also has the links at the bottom. Just the, the prettier and more built out your result looks, the more likely you are to have somebody click through. Um, these are a couple of helpful plugins for WordPress, which I'm happy to also um, talk to folks about if they're interested. But SEO Yoast is the one that I'm going to draw attention to here, because it, for those of you who are doing it yourself, SEO Yoast is a great plugin for WordPress that will actually give you color codes. So when you go to type in your title tag, it'll tell you if your title tag is green or red or yellow, um, some suggestions on how to make it better. It's your best friend if you're DIYing. Um, Google XML sitemaps is a fancy name for basically uh, automating your sitemap, which is a map of every page that's on your website. Before in the past, people had to manually make this list so that the Google bot could understand how many pages you had and what all the pages were about. The Google XML sitemap just crawls your whole website and it creates that and it also minimizes it so it doesn't take up speed um, or resources on your site. Link building, um, and we're going to probably spend about five more minutes on this in local, and then we'll hand over to Maddie on what to do with your leads. But link building, um, I like to, to kind of explain this in a way of endorsements. So link building is being linked from another website, another website putting their neck on the line saying, I trust this business, I trust this site and its content, I believe that I would send my readers to this website, right? So going back to those trust signals that Google's looking for, the more authoritative websites you have pointing to your website through the form of a hyperlink, the more Google believes you're well known and you're well trusted and you're just you're a great brand. Um, so how do you become an authority? The first step is having that great content. Um, great content just naturally will have people wanting to cite you. Right. So if you have um, charts or information on your site that people would normally go and link to a dot gov maybe if they come across your site because it's authoritative and it's showing up in the search engine um, they might want to link to your page so you could show maybe um you know all of the different types of i go back to the dangerous intersections because that's something that people really like to to look up and to have in stat form but maybe there's a nonprofit out there that's looking into how to make the roads safer they might want to link to your site and they're not linking to a lawyer site they're linking to a resource an informational page um, so just having that great content is there uh, well when we say that content is foundational it's very much foundational in that 
um, you need content for Google to even understand what your website's about. But say you and your, um, your competitor attorney down the street have the same great built out content, right? You both look authoritative. How does Google then decide, well, who's gonna be ranked number four and five or six or seven, right? That small differential. Well, the tiebreaker is links. It's now, well, they have great content, but how many people out there are endorsing their content? It becomes a number game, essentially. Um, you can't just have terrible websites linking to you, right? They need to be relevant to what you're doing. They need to be authoritative sites as well. But when it comes down to it, if you have 14 different websites pointing at you and your content and your competitor only has six, then you're going to have that competitive edge to be you know, number four or number seven in that what we discussed earlier. Um, so just keeping your content high quality is going to help you from the beginning. Um, local link building is a whole nother section of link building. Um, so this is essentially focusing on people who are in your zip code or in your city. These folks are in your community. So if Google sees that someone with the same footer address, the same city or the same zip code as you is now endorsing your content, they're likely to think, okay, well, this is someone in the community who knows this law firm, trusts this law firm. When we're thinking about which three best local businesses to place in the map pack, we consider this. So the local link building separately is another ranking signal for the local three pack, which is that map pack right under the paid ads. Um, so how can you local link build? I know a lot of people say, I'm just a law firm, you know, who's gonna link to me? Well, a lot of the law firms out there, you guys are doing things in the community already. You're either sponsoring a 5K every year, you're donating money to a cause you care about, you're participating in your kids' little leagues, whether that's donating money or time or effort. Um, you're, you know, people are helping with the town parade or or anything that's that happens once a year, right? You're giving back to your community. I say, take what you're doing and leverage it online. So instead of just sponsoring a 5K, you want to reach out to the community and say, hey, would you share this information on your site that we're sponsoring this 5K? And at the same time, you know, we have a table at the at the race and we're happy to put, you know, any of your marketing materials there in exchange. Um, and when you place that information on the page, then it says go back to your website for more information and there's your link and you're building relationships as well. And, you know, everybody here has to learn how to build relationships for your referral network, right? That's, that's one way of, of getting those cases, but you never know who people know. So just building a name and a brand in the community can also help you. Um, so just 5K, school supply drives, taking these things and making them into a bigger outreach. Um, just keep providing value to the community and it's going to naturally be links back to you. Maximize your relationships. So if you have donated somewhere, if you've volunteered somewhere, or if you're even the board member of an organization, all of those places have websites with a thank you page, a sponsor page, or maybe even your bio. So I, I would venture to say a lot of you are actually on websites and it's not linking back to your to your website, but it's relevant because it is something that you're doing in the community. It's something that has your name on it and it should be tied to your business because you are your business. You're building a brand. You're not just building a business, right? Um, make use of, of all the media and small business relationships that you have. It's, it's as simple as that at times. Best practices, um, just stay away from spammy sites. If you see that it looks too easy to get a link, then it's too easy. It's not going to be good. Um, no reciprocal link building, no, hey, buddy Joe, can you uh, put a link on your website at the cafe and I'll put one on mine for you? Google can see through that, it needs to be natural. The one item that I have on here is another plugin, which is great, but it's resource intensive, which means that it will slow down your site if you have it running at all times. But if you were to run this plugin one time every six months and then delete it after, this plugin will actually show you all of the links that are broken, um, meaning links that you used to have pointing to you may not be there anymore, or links that you used to have on your site going out to people. Um, maybe their site is no longer in existence, or maybe they changed their URL, and so now that link is broken. Um, Think outside the box. So in the old school way, you guys have heard of infographics, which was, you know, it's great content and it makes people want to point to you as a resource. But 
the new things out there, podcasts, FAQ videos, there's ways to post those on sites. So instead of just YouTube, there's Vimeo and there's a number of other sites that are very authoritative where you can post your podcast or post your FAQ video, get it out there on the internet, but you're also able to put a description line that says, this was created by firm and then link your firm name back to your site. Um, anything, everything that you do, there's probably a way to get a link that is natural. And then Ahrefs is um, one of our one of our tools that I I usually swear by, um, and I tell everybody about. It's great to kind of run your website through this and just see sometimes when you got some links lately. How many links are you building a month? Um, it can show you you know what links are no longer there, and you may want to reach out and say, Hey, this came down. Would you mind putting this information back up? Um, whatever that may be. And finally, local search. Um, this is all about how can you get into that local three pack? How can you create that healthy relationship in your city so that Google understands you're somebody in your city? Um, we've talked about organic where it's the link signals, it's your technical, it's how people interact with your page. For local, the main things that are going to affect you getting into that three pack are your are how put together and how updated is your Google My Business, um, your local citation signals, which we'll talk about what local citations are, reviews, having people say that you are a great business in your community. Google reviews are exceptionally important. Um, and then the overall authority of your website. So if you are ranking in the organic 10 pack, you have to be there in order to have that authority that will bump you into the local three pack as well. This doesn't work the other way. Just because you have a ton of reviews doesn't mean you're going to rank in the top 10 organic, right? So being in the organic will help you be in the local pack. Being in the local pack does not help you be in the organic pack. Um, and then local links, right? What we just talked about. So here you can see that there's, um, there are a couple of examples. There's a couple things to look at here. Uh, one, when you are trying to expand in an office, this is really important. You're trying to go out into another city and attract more leads in a different uh, town around you. Be careful with where you are renting an office. You don't want to be in a space that has many attorneys, especially attorneys that are doing the same practice area as you. What's happening now is when you Google, you know, DC personal injury lawyer or DC criminal lawyer, it's going to show one person from your building. It's not going to show, you know, all the different criminal lawyers in that one building. And all of those other people, if they don't have the best SEO, they're not going to be seen. So just be very careful when you're trying to plan for expansion. Um, recently, you can also see here in this picture that at the top, there is an ad. So you can now for PPC for paid ads, you can be put into the local pack as an ad. You can pay to have this happen. Um, it happens about one in every three searches for your Google pack. And then what, so what's the benefit here though? If you are in a market with the Morgan and Morgan or someone who's just completely dominating, it's a great way to get yourself into the local pack to be seen, um, but it's paid. So at the end of the day, you turn it on, you turn it off. You're gonna show if it's on, you're not gonna show if it's not on. Um, you also have to have a very authoritative uh, pay-per-click account in order to get into the local pack. So Google My Business, everyone has seen this profile, hopefully. If you Google your name and your address, your name of your brand and your address, you'll see that it pops up on the right-hand side. Um, you should have the email address that's associated with this to populate all the information on the back end to show in the front end. So if you change your brand name, if you change your address, you would be able to go in and fix that information that the user sees. Um, this is your profile with Google. It's how they understand who you are and what you're doing. Um, this is also how Google understands what website you're with. So anything that's attributed to this profile will get attributed to your website as well. Um, there are many important fields that need to be updated, but the most important are your name, your address, your phone number, and one of the newer ones is primary category. Primary category would either be personal injury, um, doctor, it could be you know, banker, but it tells exactly what industry you need to be compared with. So everyone else who has that particular 
primary category is what you're being compared with. It's also giving the user a very clear understanding of who you are and what you do. Um, having a complete profile allows for you to have enhanced Google My Business Insights. Google My Business Insights is your tracking and your metrics that Google provides you. Uh, Google is trying to be the only person in the space, right? So they want, they're coming out with all these new features for you to put information in here so that they can know about your business more, so that they can tell you more about what's happening. You're able to see a one week, one month, or one quarter snapshot in the insights and it's going to give you information down to you know what day of the week are you getting the most phone calls from your google my business um, are people finding you on the map view or the search view are you know what are your customers actions are they calling you are they messaging you are they clicking through to your website and these are just a couple of slides with some um, to show what it, it is in the back end. Here's how you can see that customers who find your listing searching for your business name or address, right? That's direct. But then you can also see how many customers are finding you by searching for a keyword. So are they searching for a personal injury lawyer or are they searching for your actual brand? Um, you know your SEO is working when it's actually searching for your keywords versus your brand. The brand is more when you're doing TV and you're doing referrals, right? But if you're doing SEO, you're looking for the audience that doesn't know you exist yet. Um, an example here of what kind of actions were taken and then also your phone calls. So if you're gonna go do a, a campaign, then you wanna do a campaign maybe on Monday, Wednesday or Thursday because that's when you have the most interaction. Um, good information to have. Some of the new features that you want to have filled in, um, posts it allows you to put information every week uh, that tells more about your business and it's good for user experience if they see something cool that you're doing that week they might be more likely to click through to your website messaging making sure that when somebody finds your google my business on a mobile phone that they are able to actually directly message you which would be a text message conversation just if you turn on this feature be careful to have some sort of auto reply because google is now also saying this business responds in 36 hours. This business responds in 15 minutes. And you don't want yours to say that it's you know taking days for you to get back to people. Um, your business description is a way to get keywords in there, but also tell people again what you do and tell Google what you do. Additional phone numbers is a really amazing new feature because a lot of the time in the past, people would have their phone number change. And then when you have all of these directory listings out there, um, with your old phone number and you change your phone number and your Google My Business and now it no longer matches all of those directories, you were not getting all the attributions you should get from those local citations, right? They weren't helping you to rank anymore because they were inconsistent. Now you're able to put additional phone numbers in the back end of Google My Business so that if those local citations match any of the numbers back there, it's okay. It's not that it can only match one number now. You can also use it for call tracking. Um, and date business established is a very new field that came out just, I don't know, maybe five, uh, maybe uh, two months ago, probably. And this is another one of Google's trust factors. So if you are a business that has been established in your community for a long time and your competitors are coming out now and they've only been around for a year, putting the date your business was established in your Google My Business will help you tremendously because it will show that you are the actual authority, the original authority in your community. That is one of the fields I would urge everybody to go fill out You know, as soon as you get off this call. Um, don't use a WeWorks and a Regis office. You can't get them verified. Google recognizes it. It won't even let you send a postcard anymore. Uh, video verification doesn't need to be live anymore. So if those postcards don't work and you had to set up a call with Google to show them around your office, you can now just take a video of your office and submit it. Um, what this says is that Google is actively trying to make it easier for their support to be, to be user friendly. Um, there's a new process to appeal for when Google has been one of your Google My Businesses have been reported as not a real location and you get suspended, there's a new way to, to appeal that. Um, just lots of great new things that Google's doing in order to, to give that good support. Um, tips for building those local citations that we talked about. So directories that you want them to be consistent with your Google My Business, your name, your address, and your phone number. Make sure that you're, you're claiming and verifying them. Make sure to use services. They cost a little bit, but 
a service will allow you to put in your name, address, and phone number one time, and this is Yex, and it'll push out to 70 different citation sites. If you don't use Yex, you have to manually go build all of these accounts. And then when something changes, like you change your brand name or you change your address, you have to manually go change them on every single local citation. With Yex, you just change it once and it pushes out in 24 hours. Um, make sure to build out those local citations completely. Can have um, you know photos, anything that makes it look more presentable, um, more information for Google to crawl. And then don't just do the regular local site the local citation sites that Google knows about. Try to find the Raleigh Best Lawyers um, directory or the Raleigh Divorce Lawyers listings. You know, find the local directories and list yourself there too. The more directories, the better. Um, just make sure that they're accurate and they're consistent and make sure that you're actually including a link back to your site on all of those directories because those are backlinks. Um, some recommended tools uh, that I can also share with you guys later, but these are just some blogs that are great. Um, following SEO industry and influencers on social media is great because you'll know if there's a new thing coming out. Um, and then reviews. Just make sure that you are trying to get these reviews. Make it easy. When you are handing over that settlement check and they are in your office, there's no better time to get that review than right then. Or when you have just you know, gone through the custody battle and you've done something good for your client, you wanna make sure they're not on your Wi-Fi, um, that they're not on your Wi-Fi, but that they um, are able to go straight to the page where they can leave you, um, leave you a review. And this will help you with your local as well. Um, make sure that you're not paying for reviews don't engage with a negative review, especially within the first 24 hours. Um, and then try not to have your stars fall under four stars. You can flag them as inappropriate and in the back end if you have anything that you want to get rid of, um, but make sure that you're just not responding negatively to these. And then third parties. Think about um, other third-party review platforms that you can use to help you get reviews um, in terms of, of making sure that you're, you're getting those Google reviews on, but also on Yelp. Uh, BirdEye and Podium are two that we know of that, that we like. So that's just something to keep in mind. All right, um, handing over to Maddie, and I know that I've used a lot of the time. We started a few minutes later here, so hopefully you guys will stick with us for a bit. Um, but now that you have all of these leads, what do you do with them? Thanks, Nalini. Yeah, no worries. Um, you know, as I mentioned in the very beginning, um, we have made these slides available to you, and I am available um, as well as Nalini via email for any questions that you may have. But let's get right into it, and I will cover as much as I can over the next 15 minutes. Um, and uh, I already introduced myself uh, as a member of the leadership team here at Smith AI. Um, we're going to talk about how you can convert the leads that are coming to your website and to your phone um, and uh, making sure that you are screening them properly, obviously capturing them and then screening them properly, um, streamlining intake and um, making good use of your time and of resources that you have outsourced to. So oftentimes what we think of is, you know, this this dilemma between lawyering and laboring. Um, the Clio Legal Trends Report from the last two years identified that um, a, a small portion of the time is actually spent on billable work per day. And what consumes the most of solo and small firm attorneys' time is actually these admin tasks, which do relate oftentimes to responding to you know, phone calls, handling emails, and even if you've launched website chat, staffing that yourself. But at the same time, we know that you know, you're spending time uh, looking at ways to grow your business, perhaps through this webinar or through other business development and networking tasks. And on average, two hours a day is spent on business development, um, whether that's a mastermind group or growing your business or working on your, you know, um, local SEO. Now, the challenge is that, all right, you're spending all this time growing your business, but you're um, not able to both complete work and respond to leads. It's really this dilemma 
where you have a, a demand for your responsiveness as a firm, but then also the interruptions result in a lot of lost productivity. So 23 minutes is the average time it takes to recover from an interruption. And on average, attorneys are interrupted six times a day. Now, at the same time, two out of three potential clients expect that you're going to respond to their first call or email and actually like base their decision on that initial responsiveness to the first call or email. So even if it's a referral, keep in mind that people may be um, you know, receiving multiple referrals. They may have a few on their short list that they found through uh, Google search, whether it's organic or paid and or local listing sites. So it's very important that you capture these leads as soon as they come to your website or give you a call. Now, also importantly, um, only 59% of people on average hire or, or didn't hire an attorney even after a consult. So it's really critical that not only are you trying to be responsive, but during that initial responsiveness, you're being very careful about who you're scheduling time with or who your teams that you've outsourced this responsiveness to are scheduling time with. So your calendar, whether it's a new consultation or um, an appointment in your office, uh, a video chat with a new potential client, that time is really valuable and you're only spending it with people who are very likely to become potential clients for you. So I've gone through those dilemmas about the, um, you know, contrast of how to spend your time between interruptions and responsiveness. As a small firm, it's really critical that you are automating tasks and leveraging technology because you don't have the resources in staff. Um, you also want to maximize the control of your work and life in a small firm. That's part of the reason why you're in a small firm and not a large one is to have the control your practice. So what does this mean? Well, we know you're spread too thin and there are limited resources. So we want to reduce the time that you're spending on non-lawyering tasks and outsource and automate and streamline them, focusing on systems that are affordable and customizable. Now, after Nalini gave her presentation, we can see how this contributes to the generation and capture process. So, you know, she was mentioning the different web lead sources, the contact methods, they may not only be on your website, someone may come to your website and give you a call, they may come to your website and chat with you, they may even go to um, send you a text message because people expect that your phone number is actually text enabled, even as a business, or they may come to you via Facebook Messenger. They may also complete the contact form on your website or send you an email in another way. Now, the ways to respond to this are obviously yourself or in-house staff or receptionist service. Now, the receptionist service can also be an agent-based service that is staffing your website chat as well. So let's keep that in mind. Um, now, during this capture process, you're also qualifying these leads. So when people are coming to you from Google search, keep in mind, and I say this all the time, people do not read. So if you are, if you've developed a really fantastic landing page and it says exactly what you do, and you have a description about, about you as an attorney and the other attorneys maybe at your firm and in and, and detailed pages of your practice areas, people do not read. So it's on you to qualify them before they schedule for that first consultation to screen them in or out. Now for the ones who screen in, then you move forward with that consultation and you can have that be free or paid. If they don't immediately convert to a consultation, then that's kind of the delayed intake where you're sending a follow-up email drip, you're making sure that you're capturing their basic information like name, phone number, and email, and then following up with them. Because for certain practice areas, I'm not including you know personal injury here where the, the urgency is there and the decision-making happens much faster, but for people who are looking for um, a business attorney or family law attorney, um, where maybe they have a few days or even longer to make a decision, it really is important to follow up with them. Um, the data shows that six follow-ups is actually um, set, like a full saturation of that that um, contact to see by six, you will know, are they going to hire you or not? Like 95% of the time. Now, six is a lot and that's a lot of time. So that's why we're focused on how do you automate 
automate this process? Well, with an email drip, for example, that allows you to automate routine emails to people who provide their email address but don't schedule a consultation with you. So you stay top of mind, you demonstrate your expertise, and you're able to say, these are all the reasons why you should hire me and not somebody else, so that you can differentiate yourself and distinguish your services for people who are finding you online because they're not coming with the same um, kind of uh, feeling and, and validation that referrals bring. Now, for the people who are not qualified that you screen out, maybe they're outside of your practice area, maybe they don't maybe they're not able to afford the the fees that you've put in place. Um, now those, let's say, quote unquote, are bad leads. I have it, you know, here as monetizing them. That's um, going to depend on your state bar and, and and bar association uh, regulations and rules and also your own comfort level. What I would say at the very least is to build goodwill in your community um, by referring people who are not well qualified for your particular firm to be a potential client to others you recommend. And that is something that you can outsource as well. So that initial screening process can not only filter people into you immediately um, who are good potential clients, but it can also filter people into you in the future. Let's say that someone has contacted your firm, you only do family law, um, but they need uh, a, a business law attorney for a trademark, for example. Now, maybe they're not the right fit for right now, but by educating them that you're a family law attorney, maybe in the future, if they have a matter either themselves or they hear of someone who has a matter in their in their network, like someone is looking for um, a divorce or child custody uh, assistance, then they will be more equipped to refer them to you. And because you took the time to educate them about what you do and don't do, instead of just saying, you know, I'm not going to call this person back or um, I'm not going to respond to this email, you actually build goodwill in the community. You may even generate a positive review if you give them a really great impression, which of course is good for um, your online reputation. Now, the different systems that we have most available are phone, email, text, and chat. If you're currently using a landline, that is okay. I understand that that's still, you know, in adoption in some law practices. Most of the time we're finding that, you know, internet-based phones have been adopted widely. Um, but what I would recommend is that if you do have, I'm just going to move to the next slide. If you do have a, a landline phone, you can add on tools like ZipWhip, Z-I-P, W-H-I-P. There are other tools like that. That's just one that I know is working very well for people. Um, to add on text messaging to the landline, um, you can also have certain numbers route directly to your cell phone. So if you're using your personal cell phone number, that to me is the worst possible scenario because it allows you no control over knowing who is calling your personal cell phone. Is it someone who needs to tell you about a personal matter or is it someone who's a new potential client that's calling you if you're answering your phone you know after hours you have no idea if it's if it's business related or not have a business phone number forwarded to your cell phone so that you know this is a business call coming in versus this is a personal call and you're also setting those boundaries so that you can have more of that work-life balance one of the things I really encourage you to do also is to have your phone systems audited because as you're having these new leads come in from your um, SEO, from your paid search, from improving your, your rankings of your website and, and getting more web leads, you're going to find that when people call you, they expect you to pick up on the first couple rings. And what we find is that even if you think you're picking up on the first couple rings, that may not always be the case. So audit your phone systems. If you haven't done it in a while, do so right after after this webinar and make sure that you ask someone to call your firm and then it rings a, you know one or two times and that's exactly what you hear on your end. If they tell you that it's ringing eight times and you only heard it ring once, then you need to contact your phone services provider and get that fixed. We hear this very often with Vonage, with 8x8, um, with other VOIP phone systems and that's something you should audit you know, fairly regularly. Now, keep in mind that when you have a website with a phone number on it, you can also change that phone number for different landing pages so that you can track how many people are clicking to call or how many people are actually calling that phone number so you can better attribute leads to your practice. Now, and I'm moving very quickly through here. So 
just bear with me. And if you want to email me with questions, then we will absolutely do that um, later on. Now, email systems, I mentioned drips, very important. If you have bulk communications that you need to send, for example, you have expanded into a new practice area or you've added a new attorney, which allows you greater ability to serve more clients, then that's something that you can use through free tools like yet another mail merge. Mailshake is another very cheap one. Let's say that you have plans for um, president Day or Easter, or um, you know, you're taking a vacation in May. These are communications that you can send in bulk and not individually to clients, or even an out of office message is a passive way of letting people know that you're out. It's better to be proactive and to improve those communications. You can also obviously send email newsletters. Um, sometimes it's really helpful for people who are in, for example, immigration law practices where they're sharing stories of success and, and getting through that process and successfully, um, you know, getting citizenship, for example, um, for their clients. So, so that can be a good tool for staying top of mind for people because those are heavy referral-based um, practices. Text messaging, as I mentioned, ZipWhip is great. Make sure that your logging time spent texting as well. Um, that's more of a for clients um, matter, but TimeMiner and other apps do allow you to um, log the time spent texting so that you can bill for it later on. Web chat is very important for immediate responsiveness. And, and this is something that I wanted to make sure to talk with you guys about. Um, it can be an AI bot. It can also be human staffed or it can be both. The thing that we kind of combine at Smith AI is we do this humans during business hours and then bots after hours. You can staff this also yourself with different solutions that are available. But again, that takes up time for your bandwidth. So what I suggest doing is having a lot of Q&A built into the bot, train it based on keywords, um, are you taking new clients or or do you, you know, can you help me with my divorce or whatever the case may be, have those keywords plugged in for your practice and then allow people to self-filter themselves in and out and connect it to your calendar so they can easily book an appointment with you or for the person who's staffing that, they can ask them the appropriate questions to screen those leads that are coming through your website, have that immediate responsiveness and you can also set them to be more passive or active depending on how engaging you want that chat to be and how much you want to prompt the visitors to engage with that. I, I strongly recommend that if you have a bot on your website, you also have a disclaimer there that is not legal advice, that you are not speaking to an attorney, um, and that this does not constitute a, a client-attorney relationship. Um, be very clear about having that disclaimer. You can also build in um, links to your knowledge base or other pages on your website where you have better descriptions of or longer descriptions of what you do and don't do, and you can have the links to this shared through chat so that the conversation isn't so time consuming. But if people want more information, you can share the link via chat and they can read that at their leisure. And if they have questions, they can, you know, kind of re-engage on that chat. Now, I really encourage you um, when you are responding to clients that you have, um, you know, predictable and accessible access to um, booking appointments on your calendar, but not making it so accessible that you have too much clogging up your time. So one of the things that we often recommend is that you accept payments for your consultations mm -hmm. or limit the time of them. And then you have payment over a certain time threshold, for example, 15 or 30 minutes. Um, if you do accept payment, you can also credit that to their first bill. So it's not extra time spent. Now, in order to hand this off, and I understand we're kind of about to go over or going over, I will wrap this up. Um, but make sure that you have the questions streamlined because until you have your questions documented and you may be saying, I know how to do my screening, only I can do it, take the time to write down your screening questions and then pass them off to someone who can handle that for you because that does not require your time as an attorney to be screening in and out potential leads. The consultation, Absolutely. The the conflict check, absolutely. Um, that can be done by a paralegal or by you. But do not spend your, your precious time um, screening the leads yourself. That can be handed off. Now, I always recommend, and as we were talking about generating leads, um, making sure that 
whoever is screening these, these new potential clients for you is asking not only basic contact information and deal breaker questions, but also making sure that they are reaching out to you for the right practice areas that you're in. And then also, how did you hear about us? Because if you wait until that first consultation to ask that question, it's going to be too late. And you want to know not only did they you know, they found you on Google, but if they can remember what they typed into Google, that is super important to get that information and make sure that you continue ranking for those keywords as, as long as it was a good lead. If it's not a good lead, then maybe that's something that you should consider. Oh, do I need to add a negative keyword, for example, and make sure that you don't rank for that if that's generating the wrong potential clients for you. So, you know, in terms of intake, um, as much as you can make it accessible to hand off to teams, the better. A lot of intake software now allows you to have a URL that is accessible to receptionist services, to uh, virtual paralegals and things like that, so that you can hand off that initial intake form completion. Um, it, it's basic intake. We're not talking about if you do medical malpractice, like completing you know pages and pages and pages of information, um, but that basic information so you're prepared for the consultation call. Um, you can also um, make sure that people who do schedule appointments, if you have it embedded on your website, and this is an example from Nickel Law Offices, um, she, Justy, she's in Colorado, she allows people to book consultations with her. But one of the things that you can do if you have this streamlined on your website is to make sure and check in with people before their consult mm -hmm. that they are actually going to be there at the right time so that you don't have no-shows and cancellations um, who are you know, wasting your time. Now, she has built in, before anyone even schedules an appointment with her, basic questions that are really important for her to have answers to so that she is well prepared for her consultation. So is a court hearing already scheduled? Can you describe your basic situation? And then a very importantly, a disclaimer that says like this, you know, you're not, you know, yet in a client attorney relationship. This is just to discuss through a consultation, um, you know, whether or not she's the right fit for your case. Um, I also really recommend that an immediate passive screening tool, if you have your basic scheduling form on your website, is to say, and this is hard to see on this screen potentially, but one of the questions here um, with Emily Cooper's law practice in Minnesota, she says, you know, what is the legal issue? Is it a family law matter? Is it a social security um, disability matter? And if not, is it other? I would even recommend maybe you don't even have other if that's not a practice area outside of the two that you, you focus on so that people, if they cannot check either one of those boxes for family law or social Social Security, they can't schedule an appointment with you and spend um, your precious time with them if they're not likely to hire you. So have those filters built in so that you're able to conserve your time with the people who are most likely to hire you. The last thing that I will say is basic intake forms can also be really great lead generation and giving something upfront can engender like a really good feeling for your practice even before someone's ready to hire you. So um, Connor Malloy at Tri-City Legal, it's a tenant law, uh, sorry, landlord law firm in Chicago. He has an eviction notice built into his website. It's really excellent for SEO. It allows him to collect a ton of data. Is it a five day or 21 day eviction notice? And then he can follow up with them to say, hey, it's been four days. How did that eviction notice um, submittal end up going? Or do you need you know, my help as an attorney with that? And he even has like automatic triggers built into his system to remind him to follow up with people whose deadlines are coming up. Now, I talked a little bit about monetizing bad leads through systematic referrals. Um, this is something you can hand off if you have a list of partners who you, or not partners necessarily, but other attorneys and law firms who you, ref, who you refer business to that you can't serve or you don't want to serve. Um, you can have that list set up. So you say, if it's this type of matter, refer to this firm and your receptionist or your front office staff can do that for you. So you're not responsible for that. You can also have emails that are triggered and follow up that says, you know, I understand that we weren't the right fit for you. This is actually what our law firm does. And here are people who may be able to help you. You can even refer them to, you know, local lawyer listing services or the bar association if they have those resources available. And you're building community there and you're engendering a good reputation by saying, I'm going to have a service first approach to you because I know that anyone in the community could be a potential referrer to me in the future.
Um, and as much as possible, really integrate your system. So if you have calls and texts, make sure that they're getting logged in communications records in your CRM. If you're using Clio or Practice Panther or Rocket Matter or any of these intake systems, you know, there's so many right now. Um, they all allow you to create a new contact, have that record in there so that when you have that first consult, or even if it was like someone who didn't um, end up being a good fit for your firm, you have that record in there immediately after the call um, so that that communication is logged and you can track the communications with that person now or later. The game plan that I have for you is just identify like the five or 10 preliminary qualification questions that you're going to use to filter these leads and save your time. Build a shareable intake form that is available via URL and then define through your qualification and intake process. Take a look and say, what do I need to continue doing? What do I need to streamline, automate and outsource? And, and can what are the things that I'm comfortable handing off now? Dip your toe in. I'm not saying you have to completely overhaul this process, but then then once you do this, kind of like take a look after one to two months and say, this worked well, I'm going to double down on streamlining these processes more for intake or qualification. I'm going to embed my calendar on my website with certain filtering before someone actually has the ability to book an appointment. And then how does this impact your practice? So like, yes, does it save you time? Has it also led to better quality, you know, um, contact with potential clients? And then how is your work-life balance and stress levels and sleep quality? Are you having um, a practice more of the one that you wanted to craft when you set out to build your small firm in the first place? And, and, and is that working for you with your current like situation and work in life? And keeping in mind always this Eisenhower decision matrix, which you can click on this link um, in if you access the slides, it basically is a function of making decisions on using your time based on the importance and urgency of the tasks. It's a matrix and what I can encourage you is that most often when we're qualifying and when we're accepting payment, that can be really time consuming and it's most easily outsourced. Data entry, lead follow-up, you know, using those email systems, um, using that automatic API integration with your practice management software, your intake software, these are things that can be automated within your software. So it doesn't require actually a human being, but it can be done on an automated basis. So I just um, dumped a ton of information to you. Um, I am available at maddie at smith.ai if you have questions about communicating um, effectively with new potential and existing clients. Um, but thank you so much for joining us today. And I hope that you, um, you know, we're able to learn a lot about the, you know, practices, the best practices for generating and capturing um, uh, web leads for your law practice.